everyone, Caleb Rundell here, and this is your video for Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17, Paul and Silas and their entourage continue their missionary journey in Greece. Now, there's a lot of place names here in the beginning, so here is a map, uh, again brought to you by Wikipedia. You can see all the places that are named here in Acts 17, and we're going to leave this map up for a bit so you can see it as you're tracing out things here in the first verses. In verses 2 through 9, we have the same old story in Thessalonica as we've had pretty much everywhere else. They show up, Paul goes to the synagogue, things don't go so hot, and they get run out. This also mentions someone named Jason, and we get no explanation. Just They went to Jason's house. No explanation of who Jason is, so who knows? Who knows who Jason is? In verses 10 through 13, however, there is a different story in this place called Beroia. And of course, I'm pronouncing that wrong. The place that starts with a B. Uh, there's a different story there where people are receptive to the message, but then people from Thessalonica come and crash the party and they have to leave that place as well. And Paul gets smuggled out. All right. So there's the map for you. I'm going to take that down. But after being run out in verse 15 through the end, Paul is in Athens. And yes, this is the Athens you're thinking of. The Athens that's still in Greek today, that is central to ancient Greek history, is the center of Greek thought and learning and philosophy and philosophers for centuries upon centuries. And while he's in Athens, Paul is on his grind, going about debating and thinking and talking about philosophy and theology and this random radical idea called monotheism and also about Jesus. In verses 18, it says that followers of the Stoic and Epicurean schools of philosophy uh, tangle with Paul. And I want to talk about those just briefly. We're not going to go in depth. Uh, but these two schools of philosophy, the Stoics and the Epicureans, are at odds with one another. They had kind of rival thoughts about how to live life and what life was and science and politics and ethics especially. Now, briefly, and this is just a poor generalization, please read more on your own if you feel so called. But briefly, the Epicureans were about pleasure and not in you know, the kind of sense we have today, but pleasure uh, in that classical sense that it is okay to take care of oneself and that can be the center for things and that's acceptable. And the Stoics taught that the highest of things is self-control and wisdom. And again, broad generalizations on those. Please read more on yourself. But these two schools of philosophies were at odds with one another but they are both drawn to Paul's presence and his message and these ideas and want to at least hear him out and hear what's going on. In verse 19, uh, Paul is brought to, brought to the, and I'm going to say this way wrong because there's a lot of vowels going on here, and my Greek is not that good when it comes to pronunciations, Areopagus, or Areopagus, Areopagus, okay. So this place, that I'm not going to say that name again, this is a physical location. It is a rock outcropping in Athens where for centuries uh, public discourse and civic councils were held. And so it's and it also became the name then for kind of the Civic Council of Athens, their kind of court of justice, if you will. And it's unclear in verse 19 which meaning is went. Did they take Paul to the physical location so he would just have a wider audience? Or did they bring him to the civic institution named for the rock, rock outcropping? It's unclear. It is nice, though, that in uh, verse 20, the author takes a nice little jab at Athenians and their reputation for philosophy and thinking and talking and gossiping about philosophy and all that sorts of stuff. So Paul's at this place. In 22 through 31, Paul gives this great speech or this sermon. And in this, he meets the people of Athens, the philosophers are that where they're at. He's saying, you're very spiritual. You're very religious. I've seen all these idols and gods that you worship. And I have some news for you. This God that you have this idol for that you say, hey, just in case we're missing anything, we got this statue up that says to the God we don't know. Just covering our bases there. And Paul says, I got, I got you covered, Athens. I am here to proclaim the message of that God that you say is unknown, that this God is very much known. 
and has some specific things for us in this new era of Jesus and resurrection. The speech that Paul gives is always a good opportunity for us to think about the idols and the gods we have in our lives. We don't have statues and names for them usually in today's world, but they're still out there, even if we don't name them. And so just something to ponder from this chapter. What are the idols and the gods in your life that you don't name that are out there? And are they serving you? Are they doing you any good? Are you serving them? Things to think about. Okay. Paul in here also says that you can search for God and find God and that God is near. This is similar to what we heard earlier where Paul said that in creation and rains and seasons and food and joy, uh, we find the blessings of God throughout creation, that those are universal. And God is saying, a sim or Paul is saying a similar thing here about God, that this God is universal and can easily be found. In verse 28, there are quotes from Greek philosophers and poems, not from scripture. Um, and again, this is Paul meeting the philosophers where they're at using their own uh, texts and poems. In verse 31, Paul talks that there is a new era of repentance that has begun, that there will be an end to time. And we got to talk about that a little bit. Paul was a person who you can see in his letters is pretty convinced that this era we're in right now is going to wrap up and Jesus is going to return possibly in his lifetime, that there's weeks, months, years, not much beyond, beyond that left. Uh, and of course, Paul was erroneous in that thinking. But either way, Paul says here, we're in a new era and this era does have a finite timeline that we're working on and that Jesus is the center of this new era. And that is attested to and assured by the resurrection of Jesus. Now, all this to wrap up in verse 32 gets a mixed reception from people. Uh, some people are like, well, this is nonsense. So that was a waste of my time. And other people were like, well, maybe we want to hear more about this. This is interesting. It's something new. It's from a new place. Uh, maybe we need to hear more about it. Uh, but that kind of wraps things up in Athens. In chapter 18, we're going to hear about Paul going to Corinth and the things that happened there. Uh, uh, to wrap up, I want to give, give a little note on the people that are mentioned at the end here of chapter 17. It mentions this Dionysus person, Dionysus, one of the Greek pantheons, uh, one of the Greek gods. This person's just named for him. They are a part of the council that's named after the rock, rock outcropping. So there's someone prominent of Athenian society that it seems like the message of Paul and Jesus has resonated with. And then this person, Demarius. And here's the thing. We don't hear about these people again in scripture, kind of like Jason we met at the beginning. These names are dropped. Maybe the audience or the original people that this Acts, uh, the book of Acts was written for would know, but we don't. We don't get to hear more about them. Uh, they probably had an adventurous life with this new faith of following Jesus and being part of the church. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll pick up in Acts 18 as the action moves to the city of Corinth. Take care. Thanks for watching.